welcoming me. Just a small caveat, actually two. I did not do my BSc here. I just did my 11th standard. After my 10th standard, I was here only for a year, 79, 80. And uh, some, the principal just asked me, why did you change to commerce? I always wanted to do commerce. But uh, I like to experiment with things. And I knew that after 11th in science, you can get 12th into commerce. So I thought I'll try science and let's see. Maybe if I like it, I'll look at it. I did Agarwal classes for IIT also. But then I still thought I'd better go for chartered accountancy. So I went to HR, a sister institution, and did my 12th and uh, BCom from there. And the second caveat, you did me great injustice, Meera. If you're going to talk about Priyanka Chopra and Aishwarya Rai, and then ask me to come onto the stage, you're already telling the audience, look, you've got a, you've got a dampener for an alumni coming here, and uh, I'm sure most of them would still prefer Aishwarya Rai coming here. <laughs> Thank you, Principal, and uh, wonderful to meet you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Shivdasani. We all miss Professor Shivdasani very much, more so because every year, religiously, he would make it a point to remember you when the alumni function was to be held. And his remembering you was not a routine invitation. It was a persuasive invitation. It was an invitation which you could not refuse. And I did attend, I think, more alumni association functions of Jain than of any other organization in my life. <laughs> Jyoti is here. Jyoti would be a part of the team making sure that uh, we came for the functions. He was gracious enough to felicitate me also at one of the functions at NCPA. But all in all, a person full of life, somebody we remember as willing to go that extra mile when it came to any any work whatsoever, be it related to the new building that Jain College has so beautifully developed, be it the activities of the college. And I'm not at all surprised that Jain continues to be the number one college in Mumbai. It was the number one when I came here. I mean, it was a natural choice if you got something, if you're a rank holder or something, the natu natural choice was that you get into Jain. And I used to come from very far away by train and change my train and come here. So change two trains to come over here, Central Railway and then the Western Railway. But you still prefer to come to Jain than not go to Ruya or, I mean, I'm not meaning any <laughs> offense to any other college, but that was nearer home. But truly it was a pleasure, a delight. But I want my wife to know that I was not like one of those children in the, in the uh, Janaganamana video. You know, I was a simple, nice, decent boy. <laughs> I never had fun in this college. And I would like her to believe that. And I just hope that none of you takes out any of the old records about my attendance or about how much time I spent in the canteen. I hope it's still at the same place. Same samosa? <laughs> Uh, well, it was a delightful period, and I, I must acknowledge to all my young friends here, to, the, to many of you who have passed out, to the young students here, that probably one of the finest periods of my life where I actually grew up, coming from a school, when you're first into the big, bad world, you're meeting people from different walks of life, you're meeting students coming from all sections of society, You've come from a cocooned 12 years of one set of friends from junior KG to 10th standard. And suddenly you're exposed to a new world altogether. And of course, amongst many things, I'll never forget the French teacher. I don't know if any of you remember the French teacher of 1979. But uh, she was truly a wonderful French teacher, taught me a lot of French. And... <laughs> And all of these small experiences actually define the person as you grow up. And it's those early years. And, and my first time in this auditorium was when we came in for admission. I don't know if the practice still continues. 
So we used to come and sit in the back rows here, wait for our name to be called out. Though I don't know why that formality ever took place. What was the thing that we checked in that uh, whole day event? But, well, it was good. It was nice to meet up with friends, make new friends, actually. And sitting here, really a lot of memories come back to mind, but I think I'll stick to talking about the future rather than the past. It's been a great uh, opportunity for the last two and a half years to be a part of the transformation journey that India is going through. I remember when the college was gracious enough to invite me for this uh, lecture series, and I do feel very, very privileged to be able to speak at the Jehim College, be amongst friends, be amongst colleagues, be amongst students who are going to pass out from the from this great institution and share some of my experiences, share what I believe are lessons that hold all of us in good stead and I hope will also give some sense of what this country can look forward to in the days and years to come. And I remember when we were talking about what subject we should talk about, I thought it would be nice to talk about how we can make this transformation of India a sustainable journey going forward. There are many ways to develop a nation. There are many things that can be done. And clearly, the nation has had a glorious past, has had many, many years of wonderful things happening in the country. Many good, some not so good, some could have been better. That's a part of the evolution of a nation. But all in all, we've seen the nation over the last seven decades evolve into what it is today. But can we rest on where we stand today? Or can we derive satisfaction in the way the country has moved over the last 68 years? Or do we need to sit back and relook at what were the possibilities that we missed out on? Could we have water? Could we have done the job differently? Could we have done the job better? And I would just like to share with you some of my own experiences in this last couple of years and the thinking that goes behind this new government that came into office in May 2014. We're all aware of uh, the kind of despondency that had set into the nation around the time the Modi government got sworn in. The country was going through a phase where I know a number of people who had turned cynical about the future of India. And I remember a lot of people also worrying for their children, for jobs, for the development of the nation, whether India would be able to sustain such a large population, what we often would call a demographic dividend. Would that dividend become a liability? rather than something we can cash on and something which can help the country emerge stronger and better in the years ahead. And it is in that backdrop that an aspirational billion, a, people, a set of people wanting, desiring a better quality of life for themselves, elected this new government in 2014. We had two choices before us when we came into office. And I remember a lot of discussions taking place within the cabinet and in smaller groups with experts at that point of time, where we could look at certain short-term solutions, certain band-aid solutions, which could give a sense of prosperity and a sense of happiness in the immediate term, but not necessarily prepare the nation for a long haul of development, for a series of years where India could look at growth, where India could look at inclusive growth, where India could look at development as a matter of course and not as an exception. And at that point of time, we chose the path which possibly could seem more painful in the short run, but would certainly give India better results, a more sustainable future in the long haul. And as I sit back after two years and reflect on that early few months, I personally believe we chose the right path because the India of today 
is not desirous of one term or five years of good government. We are looking for 20, 30, 50 years of good government going forward. And what we are desirous of is processes being set right, procedures being set right, the framework being created so that India prepares itself for decades of prosperity in the years ahead. It's, it's analogous to a building that you have to construct. If any of you is familiar with the way a building is designed and constructed, if you're constructing a two, three-story building, you just dig a small hole, maybe go down six or eight or ten feet into the ground, take out a little soil from the subsurface, build a small foundation, on the top of which you can very easily form a three, four-story building. And that, build, that structure can take a three, four-story building very comfortably, safely, but you can't expand that building and create another five stories on top of that. On the contrary, if you were desirous of building a skyscraper, if you wanted to create a hundred story building, then you really need to dig deep into the ground because you want to create a strong foundation on which you can create a hundred story superstructure. And if you have to make a strong foundation, when you dig deep, a lot of muck comes out. You need to take out that muck. You need to design a good foundation, a solid foundation. You need to execute it well. You need to make the foundation well. A good design foundation, unless executed and created well, can also be equally harmful. If it is porous, if water seeps into it, or there are some weak links within the foundation of the actual construction of the foundation, you're actually creating a threat for the building that you're going to create. So dig deep, take out a lot of muck, design a good foundation, create a good structure on that foundation, and then it's very easy to make the superstructure. Niranjan Hiranandani is not here today, otherwise he would be able to explain that with today's technologies and leveraging on technology, you can actually create a floor in every uh, in that building, in that skyscraper, probably every week or two weeks now. So if you create a solid and a good sustainable framework of good governance, of good principles, then it's very easy to create a long-term prosperity for the nation, similar to a large skyscraper or a tall building. And that, ladies and gentlemen, has been the effort that this government has tried to do, do a serious root cause analysis of what was going on, what was not right, what could have been done better after years and years of experience. And after that root cause analysis, design a sustainable framework around which this country can hope to see decades and decades of prosperity and happiness for the people of India. And that sums up what the effort and what the direction of this government is in our journey to transform India and the Indian economy. In this journey, we thought it will be useful to work on certain principles rather than just look at issues as they come on a case-by-case -case basis. So as I said, we did a root cause analysis but then we also had to prioritize our work. What needs to be done first? What is essential to first be sorted out? And what would be the series of steps that would really make this country great? And, and I'll, I'll probably draw on uh, certain examples from my ministries to explain the thinking behind it. So unless I set my coal availability problem right, I'll never be able to arrange for enough power in this country. So if the fuel is not available, you can't generate power. Unless you generate enough power, you won't have the need to transmit that power. Unless you transmit power across the country, there won't be power to reach your homes or your factories. So there's a whole value chain. We need to understand in each aspect of that value chain, what are the deficiencies, what is the problem? That's where the root cause analysis is done. 
And then you prioritize that, sort out coal, ensure stranded projects come on stream so there's enough generating capacity. Look at the areas where there's a transmission bottleneck, focus on those lines and get those transmission lines on. And finally, address the problems of the distribution companies for the last mile connectivity. And once you prioritize and do things systematically, that's the only way you'll be able to ensure that there's no weak link left in that chain. So you couple your root cause analysis with prioritization of issues and superimpose decisive leadership, the willingness to take decisions. Don't dilly-dally on taking decisions. Bite the bullet. If there's a problem, address it. Accept it, address it. Don't let that fester. Don't let that continue for long. That decisive leadership is what really determines or defines success for any government. But whatever actions you take, are those actions focused on outlays or are they focused on outcomes? After all, one can take a number of decisions based on budgets. The government usually works on budgets, that I have a budget of a thousand crores, so I'll do this, 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 and this. But that may not necessarily be the outcome that is most desirable. But if we were to turn it around 180 degrees and say these are the outcomes that we want to achieve and then plan where the money is required, what would be the most efficient and effective utilization of that money, you can get far more for every dollar that you spend or every rupee that you spend than if you were to work the other way around that this is the budget and let me work around what the available budget is. And therefore, we focused on outcomes rather than on outlays. Once you decide you've got to make this country, let's say, a coal surplus country, then the objective is clear. Work backwards to see what you need to do to become a coal surplus country. If you decide you want to expand your renewable energy program from a small 3x or 4x growth to a 30x growth, then once you decide that is the outcome I want to reach, and I'm alluding to the solar mission that the country has taken up. When I became minister, the country had about 2,400 megawatts of solar installations. We decided we'll expand it to 100,000 megawatts, 40x. A lot of opposition came in. It wasn't an easy journey. It took months of persuading the entire system to come on board. But once you make up your mind, you find solutions to the issues. And today, ladies and gentlemen, India is going to embark on the world's largest ramp-up rollout of solar energy, clean energy, environmentally friendly energy ever witnessed in the history of mankind. And all of this is possible once you focus on transparency as the credo of all that you're going to do. So all the actions... And you saw what happened in the coal scam in the earlier years, where coal blocks were allotted to friends and relatives and party leaders indiscriminately without a proper process, without proper procedure being followed. The courts chose to cancel the allotment of 204 coal blocks. And I still remember the despondency that had set in at that point of time. The feeling that people had that now we could run out of power with coal shortages and power supply becoming an issue. At that point of time, the choice was the nations whether to look at this as a crisis or to look at this as an opportunity. And I'm delighted to share with you that we'll use that opportunity in a twin-fold fashion. Not only did we solve the problem of a more transparent and honest auction process to give out these coal mines, but using a cue from that, taking a cue, we decided that all natural resources in this country, whatsoever it may be, will henceforth only be given out by a transparent auction process so that the wealth of this nation, which belongs to the people of India, will serve the people of India for years and years to come out of the revenue that is generated from this wealth. And that became the credo of this government. Every action to be brought into the public domain in a transparent fashion, and every allotment of a natural resource 
only to be conducted or carried out through a transparent, equal opportunity process for everybody to participate in. And that gives so much confidence to investors, it gives confidence to the people of India that their wealth is safe, even though it's in the hands of politicians at times. But one can look at with confidence that the natural resources of this country will remain safe and will continue to serve the people of India. And in that sense, this transparency helps also in building a system of accountability and the monitoring by the people of India about the actions of the government. So all the actions, if they are made transparent, help the people of India to monitor the performance of government. Are they working in the right fashion? Are they working honestly? Is the government really working for a better quality of life for the people of India? And as we increase the transparency levels, the people of India will get an opportunity to control and decide their own destiny based on solid facts. And we have tried to do that. For example, in my own ministry, through the use of mobile apps, we are trying to give more and more information to the people. At times, it leads to a lot of embarrassing questions being asked. But those embarrassing questions are really a reality check on the system and help to better the processes going forward. The whole purpose of this transparency is a greater degree of people participation. And as much as the people will participate in government, that much better the processes will become going forward. Therefore, holding the government accountable to its work by close monitoring is an essential aspect of good governance going forward, which we're going to try and expand to levels never seen before through dissemination of more and more information and knowledge to the people of India. Of course, being a chartered accountant, I've used innovative financing. And the entire government structure is focused on trying to see how we can set the economy right using more and more innovation in financing methods, financing government projects. So when we had to do the bullet train project, uh, we partnered with Japan. And we've got a 50-year line of credit at 0.1% which can actually help us get into the new age of technology, bring greater facilities into the country at an extremely low cost, which will help expand the infrastructure, help expand, develop a better uh, rail network, road network, power network going forward. Innovative financing can also help startups, can also help bring manufacturing to India. Innovative financing can help bring the cost of power, bring the cost of utilities down. And I think that's an area where my own personal training and my own experience of 30 years really helped me in my work to keep costs down, to keep a control on costs in the system. Of course, the typical things that we all do in terms of bringing, bringing down red tape, improving the competitiveness of India. I don't know if you have uh, looked at the competitiveness index that the World Economic Forum takes out every year. Last year, the country had improved 16 notches in the, in the competitiveness index from what we had inherited when we came into government. I'm delighted to share with you that only recently, the World Economic Forum has come out with their competitiveness rankings for the last year, and we've further notched up 16 points. So two years, we've notched up 32 points in our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the other nations of the world. And from a level of, I think, 84 or 83, we are now down to 51 or 52. And I do hope in the years ahead, we can further improve our competitiveness rankings to bring it into the 20s and 30s. That will, these are the type of structural and fundamental changes, the ease of business program the effort to cut down on bureaucracy, the effort to improve transparency. I remember when I first became minister, at an average, every day, I would get about 100 odd files. And it just shocked me to see so many files coming up to me. So I did two principles. I said, I will never sign a single file which relates to a particular case. Only bring up procedure or policy to me.
And then based on that policy, the department can clear all pending issues. And the second was, I said, delegate whatever you can. You'll be happy to know today, at an average, those 100 files have come down to four or five files, maximum, on any working day. No dalal, no liaison officer, no corporate communications guys, no general manager's Delhi office, head of Delhi liaison office, are allowed to come into the corridors of any ministry in Delhi. They have an issue, send in a mail. We'll address that issue on policy. Any issue that gets flagged off, you are all free to send us a complaint, send, send us a problem. But we'll not address your problem. We'll benchmark it to the policy, find out whether you are at fault or the policy needs an improvement, address the policy change so that not only your case, but hopefully 100, 200, 50, whatever, other people who are stressed because of the same problem can get relief out of your flagging of your problem. And these, are, these may seem very small interventions, but believe me, these small interventions can be game-changing at times. I mean, for that matter, the other day we found the laws of the nation. There's so much that can be done. I asked my office to find out how many laws are there in this country. We know we couldn't figure out how many laws are there in this country. Because the center has laws, the states have laws, corporations have laws, and I don't know who else has laws. There is, we could not put a fix on the number of laws that are there in this country. In fact, uh, they, there is a law which must have started some 100, 200 years ago, I don't know, in which every day a balloon is sent up in some cities to report certain characteristics that they find. The balloon goes up and it reports back maybe meteorological data or weather data or whatever. But it continues because the law stands. And you'll be amazed that in this short period, we've already been able to remove over 1,100 obsolete laws. And we still find every single day some or the other new law coming up which needs to be removed from the statute. And I'm sure you all know, at least I'm a student of law, so I, I, I must share with you that ignorance of the law is no excuse. So technically, we are all supposed to know all these 25,000 odd laws that exist in the country every part of the country that we go to. And it's, it's, these are the small irritants that have held back the true potential of this country. And I think if we work in a true spirit of partnership with all stakeholders, if we work in a spirit of involvement of all sections of society in decision making, we can truly transform this nation, create a framework which sustains this nation for years and years to come. And to my mind, 8%, 9%, 10% growth should not be a one-off or should not be an occasional development for India. What we require in India is sustainable growth for three or four decades in the future, hopefully double-digit growth. We want that growth to be inclusive so that it reaches every section of society. And we want that growth to be sustainable in the sense that we also keep intergenerational equity in mind. It's not as if our generation can choose to mess the entire future of this country or the future generations of this country for our own greed or for our own good. As it is said, we are really trustees for the next generation. We on this planet, we on Earth today, are trustees for our next generation. We'll have to protect the environment. We'll have to protect nature. We'll have to leave behind a better world to live in than what we inherited. And in that sense, sustainability, care for the environment, concern for the future children of this country will have to be an equal component of our growth. Growth cannot be indiscriminate. We cannot use away the natural resources of this country in an indiscriminate fashion. We have to calibrate the use of these resources to ensure intergenerational equity. If we look at the actions of this government in the last two, two and a half years, 
you will find that almost on every issue, we have tried to bring in these principles of governance, good governance. After all, what is good governance? Good governance is a set of principles or commandments which if followed effectively and efficiently can deliver a better quality of life for the people of the country. And should a government focus itself on the last man at the bottom of the pyramid, should a government focus itself on the future generation's prosperity? Should a government focus itself on providing a corruption-free government, a government which does not live for the day, but lives for the future, a government which creates frameworks of good governance, which outlive the term or tenor of any government, that, to my mind, is the duty and job enjoined on any government that comes into power. Politicians will come and go, governments will come and go, but the country remains one, the country remains strong, the country gets a bright future for the people of India, and that is true transformation of a nation in a sustainable manner, in a manner which can take this country ahead for a long way. And we, the youngsters of this country, have a big, big role to play if we are going to make this transformational journey successful. There are so many programs that we have initiated, none of which, in isolation, will really define what we are setting out to do. But if seen in the context of a, maybe a, 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 a whole garland of beads, will really define where we see this country going. So I remember in the early days when we brought out the Swachhata mission, the Clean India campaign, there are many people who said, Prime Ministers are not expected to talk about Swachhata. Is the Prime Minister meant to be bothered about garbage on the streets? But to my mind, it was the most defining and important program that this country could have ever embarked on. More so, because Swachhata is not something it's, that relates only to removing garbage from around our environments. Of course, a good and clean environment is always more delightful to work in. I'm sure you wouldn't have liked to see this stage with a plastic bottle thrown here or there or a Pepsi can or a Lay's packet around here. I'm sure in our own homes we keep our homes neat and clean, our offices neat and clean. But we, are, we don't bat an eyelid if we were to roll down the window of our car and maybe throw out the wrapper of a chocolate or an ice cream. But the same person in Singapore or Dubai wouldn't, bother to, wouldn't ever dare to do that. So it's more something that gets ingrained in our mind. And once it gets ingrained in our mind, Swachhata transcends just cleanliness. It transcends into a clean mind, into clean thinking into a clearer vision, into better health for the people of India. And then when you juxtapose Swachhata also with the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao campaign, you understand that the girl child is very precious. Looking after that girl child comes out of a clean mind. I don't know if any of you remembers on 15th August 2014 in the first address to the nation on 15th August from the ramparts of the Red Fort, the Prime Minister had raised a very small point. My 18-year-old daughter was sitting on the ground below the Red Fort and she, she was very much touched by that uh, comment of his, where he said, we are always telling our young girls how to behave. We're telling our young girls how to dress up, to stay out behind, behind a curtain or whatever else. Have we ever realized that the real person we need, we need to teach are the young boys on how to behave with girls? <laughs> on how to deal with young girls? And in that sense, these are small messages. But in these small messages, there's a deep thinking behind it. When we talk of digital India, it's not just about taking Wi-Fi to your schools and colleges or the villages. It's about leapfrogging technology so that the people of India can 
benefit from the outcomes of that technology faster. I, mean, I remember in my own work, we are spending seven, eight hundred rupees for an ordinary meter, which can be easily tampered when you're checking the electricity consumption in your homes. And we all have faced probably exaggerated bills and meters, faulty meters and things like that. But if we were all to expand the scale of our smart meter program and make it a mission that every meter in the country will be a smart meter, possibly instead of seven, eight hundred rupees, you may have to spend a thousand rupees, a little bit more. We can bring down the cost with economies of scale and with technology improving. But imagine the consequences of that on the nation as a whole, on power theft, on the confidence we have on the bills that we have to pay, on the ability to monitor the utilization of power, on the ability to collect our bills more honestly. These may look small, small ideas, but small ideas can have transformational impact on the nation. I've mentioned about my LED program ad nauseum. I don't know if any of you are even aware of it. But the country today is moving into an LED age. The whole world should have been moving by now. But India is now leading the world's efforts on energy conservation. There was a time India would be five years, ten years behind the developed world when it came to introducing new technology in our country. Also, we thought technology was very expensive. On, on one occasion, when a company, a government company, came and showed me their program to introduce LED bulbs in the country, it suddenly struck me that a country of India's size, if we can replace all the bulbs with LED bulbs, we can actually bring down the carbon emission by about 80 million tons a year by reduced energy consumption. So using LED bulbs instead of those old incandescent bulbs or the CFL bulbs can help this country reduce our energy consumption by 112 billion units, which translates to about 40,000 crore rupees reduction in the electricity bills that the people of India pay. Now, so, ladies and gentlemen, that program do you think that program should be carried out five or ten years after America and Europe convert to LEDs? Or should we do it post-haste? Now, that, that program was being carried out in India. In the year 2013-14, this company, which was tasked with introducing LEDs in India, was buying seven-watt LED bulbs for 310 rupees and subsidizing it a little bit. And in the whole year, 2013-14, they sold 6 lakh bulbs, 600,000 bulbs. At that speed, it would take us a few thousand years to probably replace all our LED bulbs, all our bulbs with LEDs. India, India has, in our estimation, about 770 million bulbs that we use for lighting the homes all across India. And I suspect 770 million is a very uh, conservative estimate. I personally believe it will be much more. We have about 250 million homes. But be that as it may, even with 770 million bulbs, if we replace all of those 770 million with LEDs, the country stands to save six and a half billion dollars every year. So we decided let's scale it up. And you'll be happy to know in a short span of two years, we have not only been able to bring down the price at which the government company used to procure these bulbs from 310 rupees for a 7 watt bulb to 38 rupees for a 9 watt bulb, giving 30% more illumination. And mind you, we have not compromised on any specifications. The specs are tighter than what they were two years ago. The technical qualification criteria are harsher than what they were two years ago. And by the way, the 38 rupee price has been offered by the world's largest lighting supplier. The world's largest lighting supplier. 38 rupees. A fall of nearly what? 88% in two years. And now that bulb has a payback period for consumers of barely four or three or four months, five months. 
in a city like Mumbai, the payback would be probably two or three months, the kind of bills that we pay in Mumbai. But just imagine, the, not a single rupee subsidy. We'll be replacing these 770 million bulbs in a span of four years. We've already, this government company, which used to sell 600,000 in a year, currently is selling 600,000 every day. That's a scale up of 300 times. And they've already crossed 160 million in 16 months. They started somewhere in May last year. And by now it's about 18 months. In 18 months, they have crossed 163 million bulbs sold by this one single government company. Which gives me the confidence that we'll, by 19, we can see India 100% LED at an affordable price, bringing down the impact on environment pollution, saving all of you 40,000 crores in your electricity bills every year. If you can, that is, that is what transformation is all about. And what brought about this change? A decisive leadership, the willingness to say we can do 770 million in four years, transparency in procurement, not a single rupee corruption is required to supply a bulb to the government anymore. Everything is transparently on the website available. You don't have to go to the government for payment. Payment comes into your bank account on the 30th day through an RTGS if you are a supplier. We use innovative financing where I told state discoms that you charge only 10 rupees a month and supply these bulbs. So the savings of the consumer will be more than what they have to pay for that bulb. They'll pay for six or seven, eight months. After that, they'll enjoy the savings for years and years to come. And scale. I don't know if some of you remember Mr. Modi's election slogan. Speed, skill, and scale. This small program in a, in a small way actually reflects all these three. We brought in economies of scale, took the program to a large dimension, ran the program skillfully, and brought in speed in execution. And when you do that, that's truly game-changing, that's truly a way to reach sustainable growth, sustainable benefit to the people of India. Subsidies, ladies and gentlemen, can never do anybody good. Subsidy can, can only be a restraining factor. After all, if I have a thousand crores to give as a subsidy, and I give 10 rupees a bulb as a subsidy, then I'll only have an ability to give X number of bulbs in a year to the people of India. But if it's an economically viable proposition, Sky is the limit. The people will enjoy participating in that because they benefit from it. And government doesn't have to be stressed about any limiting factors. And that has been the thinking on which we have been working. Can we take benefit of good governance to the people of India? Small, small interventions sometimes can become quite game-changing. I remember, I don't know if many of you or any of you are involved in farming back home in your villages, or in your hometowns. But every year you might have read in newspapers a fertilizer shortage used to come in. During the time of the harvest, there used to be riots at different places because of fertilizer shortage. It is a problem the nation has grappled with for years. When we came into government, the fertilizer minister decided that I have to do something about it. And look, what did we find? Since fertilizer is deeply subsidized, a lot of it gets diverted for use by chemical factories and is sold in the black market and farmers who deserve it don't get it. And what was the solution? Real simple. We coated the fertilizer with neem. So now all fertilizer sold to farmers comes with a neem coating. Simple solution. It may sound very silly and maybe, maybe obvious to many. But now with that neem coating, that fertilizer has become useless for the chemical factories. And all the fertilizer that needs to go to the farmers lands up in the hands of the farmers, not in the black market anymore. Simple intervention. Two years, there's been no riots for fertilizer or shortage of fertilizer. It's in the mind. It's, you have to decide whether you're going to live in an era of shortages 
or you're going to live in an era of surpluses. I remember when I announced that we'll increase Coal India's production to a billion tons. We were barely producing 462 million tons at that point of time. I said six years will be a billion tons. My predecessor, who was in government before I took oath, in parliament sometime in December 2014, ridiculed me no end. He said, Mr. Goyal, you've just come into government. You're a, you're a rookie. You still have to learn the ropes of government. You're talking about doubling coal production in a country where we would never do 1 or 2% growth in coal production. Don't make such tall claims. You'll fall flat. There's a parliament speech of a former minister holding my portfolio. We took that up as a challenge. It's the same company. It's the same people, the same workers, the same management team. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. I have not taken one new person into that company. The same people gave us 6.9% growth in our first year, gave us 8.6% growth in the second year, and we converted a country which was perpetually full of shortages of coal into a country now where the director marketing of Coal India literally has to go all around the country trying to sell his coal to the people rather than sitting in his office and black marketing coal. It's possible. It's in the mind. And I say this to you young uh, boys and girls from the college and the new uh, students who have passed out. Because you are venturing into the real world. If you venture with that kind of a confidence, if you convert every crisis that you confront into an opportunity, if you participate in government, if you participate in whatever is happening around your life with enthusiasm, with gusto, just like you saw in that uh, initial film, the documentary we saw, or the, uh, the recording of Janaganamana, if we can all, just like as we heard the tunes of Janaganamana, you saw everybody in every office in the classrooms participate out of the national spirit, out of the spirit of respect for the nation. If we were to all take up whatever small things that come to our notice, you may be traveling in a train and you see something which is not right. If you can tweet about it, if you can let somebody know about it, somebody in government, somebody who matters, somebody who can make a difference, if you can move, go and try and solve a problem yourself, rather than only saying that it's not my job to do it, it's somebody else's job. If you can participate in the life around you. And I was driving into Jain College just now. We could possibly do a Swachata Abhyan only in this lane. Swagat, what is that restaurant at the end? Not sw Swagat is over there? Satkar, Satkar, sorry, no, no, Satkar. Swagat is at Nairman Point. I know how many idli plates I've had at Satkar. But if we could just look at the lane from the marine drive up to Satkar, a small thing, just a small beginning. But it could make a difference. I saw some twigs of uh, trees lying around the place, some plastic bottles or packets on the, behind the cars as I drove in over here. Small things. But it, it's, it's, the, it's in the mind. Are we bothered about what's happening? If our Wi-Fi didn't work, did we do something about it or did we just accept it as it's going to happen? If in a train you found the train bogey was not clean, did you do something about it or did you just accept it as that's how it is? If in your classroom your teacher was not diligent, did you tell the authorities or the principal or did, did you just let it be? Everything adds up. And these are, the, these are the things that define our own future. After all, our future of this country is going to be in your hands. In some sense, all of us sitting in the front here, pardon me for that, Meera, but all of us are now going to be moving out, fading out. It's they who are going to be running this country. You will all gradually participate in different forms in the future of India. But if you were to not give up, if you were to be conscious citizens, if you, were be, if you would be willing to make a difference to your surroundings, to your workplace, to your college, to your homes, to your neighborhood, 
believe me, this country can be a different world altogether. And I seek your participation. I seek your active involvement in making this country great, in working together. It, it is immaterial which government comes, which government goes, who wins an election, who loses an election. These are things that will happen over the years. You will like some government, you will be elected. You may not like a government, you will change it. That will be a part of the evolution of this country. But good people will always have a place in the future of this country. And I'm sure the moorings that Jain College gave to me and to each one of us who has passed out of this college or who is studying here gets that opportunity to learn the goodness of life. And if we can take that goodness of life, after all, being number one college is not only about academics. A college experience is a 360 degree holistic experience that we get in college. If we can use this experience of college well, if we can be honorable, decent, good citizens of this country, Jain College can make a difference to the future of this country. Just the 10, 20, 30,000 students who have passed out of this college can actually transform this country. And I invite all of you to be a partner, to be a part of this transformation journey in the years to come. Let's work together for a better, brighter, a more prosperous future for India. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for the support. So, will you please have a seat? And they've been very anxiously waiting to ask you some questions. <laughs> all right, all the student coordinators, be ready and reach out to anyone who's asking a question. I request some of our board members, please join, sir, on the stage. Good evening, sir. I'm, I'm also an alumnus from the college. I'm extremely enthused to hear your very enlightening speech, which gives me great confidence as you say that our country is going to be um, uh, an inspiration for the entire world. Uh, my question to you, sir, is I have relocated as an expat uh, before your government came into place. And I see that our pr current prime minister is encouraging. Those services were quite a hurdle. So I would encourage you to um, focus the Prime Minister and your efforts to welcome such talent. You all use the, um, the efforts of many during the campaigns. So even in building the country, I would encourage you to focus the efforts there. Sir. Thank you again. Ma'am, that's very good. Thank you very much for your suggestion. It's an absolutely brilliant suggestion. I'll just point out to you and to any other person who may be willing to participate. We have a, a website, mygov.in in which uh, a lot of people write in to the Prime Minister and many people write about what their background is and how they can participate in uh, nation building. And I would urge you to get onto that, mygov, M-Y-G-O-V dot in. We have a team there which assesses 
what role or in what form people can participate. Many people want to do pro bono work. Many people are looking for paid assignments. Many people write in with ideas. And we try to disseminate those ideas to different departments and take them forward. But I would sincerely urge you to write in on that. And I'm happy to hear from you also. If, I, if we get to know, uh, you can write in to me uh, directly. My email ID is simple. It's Piyush Goyal, P-I-Y-U-S-H. G-O-Y-A-L, B-J-P, at gmail.com. And uh, if we know what's the background of people willing to serve the nation, then we can see in what role each one of us can participate. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Upama Nyu. I'm a second year BMS student here at Jaihan College. And uh, we're very honored to have you, uh, have you here this evening. So my question is, you mentioned leapfrogging technology, and I noticed you're uh, using technology all the time. You're using this platform called Twitter to engage with millions of people in this country. So this morning, you uh, tweeted an article about how Tamil Nadu is uh, using wind power, and they've actually uh, increased their wind power capacity by 70%. So my question is, how would you scale that across uh, all the different states in India? And is wind power the future of renewable energy in India? Wind power is still facing certain challenges, young man. Uh, one of the biggest challenges on wind power is it's very intermittent. And forecasting and scheduling wind power has still not, uh, at least in India, reached the proportion of uh, science. It's still quite unpredictable. I'm working closely with the wind power associations to introduce the most modern scheduling, forecasting methods so that we can forecast when and how much power these wind generators will generate and back down the other more polluting forms of power at that appropriate times. Because ultimately, grid management of the frequency is one of the most critical functions of the government uh, transmission utility. And uh, you remember the 2012 blackout all over the country. Twice it happened in July 12 and August 12. It's something that the nation should never allow to happen, and we would hope that it never happens in the future. So managing the grid is one of the most critical functions. And when large amounts of wind power flows in suddenly, unless you back down some other power, it won't work. Having said that, we are trying to introduce, as I said earlier, technology by which we can forecast it well. Wind will play an important role. We are currently at about 34,000 megawatt of wind installation in India. I hope to scale it up to 60,000 megawatt by 2022. Coupled with the other forms of renewable energy, we'll go up to 175,000 megawatt by 2022. And if we add our hydro capacity, we'll cross 2,25,000 megawatts. We'll probably be the world's largest renewable energy generator by that time. Good evening, sir. Uh, when can we expect the government to subsidize electric hybrid cars? Or if not subsidize, uh, at least promote uh, like many of the European countries? I love that question, my young friend. Only this morning. Actually, this is a subject I've discussed in the last three days, three times. On Tuesday, I discussed this with the Honorable Prime Minister. On Wednesday, I discussed it with the Minister for Heavy Industries, who runs the FAME program, and with the Road Transport Minister, Mr. Gadkari, Anand Gite, Gadkari, and I. We are all three from Maharashtra, by the way. We discussed it on Wednesday, just before the Cabinet meeting. And this morning, I discussed this with the additional secretary in that ministry, and with the people from IEEMA, the Electrical and Electronics Manufacturers Association, whose AGM I had uh, inaugurated this morning. So it's a subject I love, and I'll tell you why I love, apart from the impact it will have on a cleaner environment. As I said earlier, from an era of shortages, India today has moved into an era of power surplus. So I myself have become a salesman, trying to generate new demand for electricity so that the power plants can function and generate and sell power. And for that, the electric vehicle industry 
is a tremendous opportunity where India can leapfrog technology, as your erstwhile colleague had mentioned. I, I was uh, discussing this, as I said, on Tuesday, and I said, most parts of the world, the developed world, everybody is already a vehicle owner, maybe a two-wheeler, three, four-wheeler, whatever. India still is an evolving and emerging economy. We still are going to use millions and millions of vehicles going forward. People may start with a two-wheeler, they may graduate to a four-wheeler, to a sedan, to an SUV. And so we have this great opportunity, I believe, in electric vehicles, where instead of everybody first buying a petrol-driven car or a diesel-driven car, and then replacing it with an electric vehicle car, let's shoot to go straight for an electric vehicle car for first-time car owners or uh, scooter or motorcycle owners. And this morning I told the additional secretary, get out of the mindset of subsidies. I, that's what I just talked about. I said, till you give us subsidy, this program will never take large dimensions. What we need to do as government, and we are now going to work very actively on it, is to create the infrastructure required to make this program a success. So we have 60,000 petrol pumps in the country. We'll now try to see if we can put up fast charging stations in all these 60,000 petrol pumps. So just like you go and fuel up on a petrol pump, you could possibly go to a petrol pump and in 15 minutes charge your battery. Or we could have batteries clamped down where you open the battery, leave it there, put in a new battery and drive out. Make battery a consumable. So we're looking at new and new ideas and I urge all of you young boys and girls, come up with some ideas which can help us scale up this program really in an efficient and fast, speedy manner so that we can gradually get out of these petroleum-driven cars which not only pollute the environment but are also expensive. And I personally believe with the advent of technology and with storage costs coming down, battery costs coming down, very soon these cars will become a far more economically viable proposition than petrol-driven cars. And you can charge them at home in your night, at, at night time. Just at your home, put it into a plug and charge your battery. Next morning, you're all set to go. So we are very, very keen and actively looking at innovative solutions to our program. I'd urge you to also share any ideas that you may have. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so, oh, over here. So I'm Atish Jain, currently studying mass media. Uh, which is a really creative field. On the contrary, I'm assisting my father in a steel business, which is not much creative. So uh, basically my question is, so we've been trying to get entries into government. My father doesn't. Basically, I'm trying to get uh, entry in government companies to supply material and all. But so it's been a really tough task to get into it. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know if you are aware, but there are literally brokers, you know, you have to pay those brokers to get entry into the, uh, into the government companies. So I don't know, uh, how do you uh, tap on to the government uh, companies as well as uh, we have uh, uncles and, aunt, you know, uncles who are into diamond, who are into diamond business. So there are these um, uh, laboratory made diamonds coming in from China and stuff like that. So the market has, you know, fallen down. So what is the solution for all this, sir? Both are good questions, young man. As regards the steel industry, after the introduction of MIP, I think by and large the steel industry is rocking right now. So I do hope your parents are, or your family business is not having any stress. But the stress about getting entry into government contracts is very genuine. We have made a sincere effort, and I do hope you, you've been able to feel the difference that the government of India, after all, corruption, we always said, starts from the top. We're making a sincere effort to make sure the top gives a clear message down of transparency and honesty. But as it percolates down, sometimes it does take time. But we need vigilant uh, citizens like you or people like you who tell us where these problems are. Just before I came here, my last meeting before I came to Jail College, Somebody mentioned to me about a company which has just recently come under me in the Mines Ministry, where he said that the government company has some agent, and he gave me a name, through whom they try to sell more material. So I've told him, immediately send me more details. I'll have vigilance, keep a watch on that company. And 
maybe read it or maybe find out, get enough uh, details to be able to take action. Very often we generalize corruption. We say everything in India is bad. Everything is, everybody is corrupt. Now this generalization, this cynicism isn't going to get this country very far. We will need to have people who are willing to speak up, people who are willing to stand up and stand for certain principles. And we are willing to stand with you. Any of you brings out these things to our knowledge. We are willing to bite the bullet. We are willing to take them head on. And I would urge all of you in this room, wherever you come across any of these things, please do tell us, please talk about it. And I'm sure things can be sorted out. But then if you are trying to short circuit a system and then you are caught with your pants down, please don't blame us. We have to come with our hands clean when we are coming up to complain. So I'm sure there are these things which are going wrong. There have been traditional problems the country is facing. But if you and we all work together, and in this it, it transcends political ideology or boundaries also. It doesn't have to be one party or the other. We can all work together in trying to put an end to this. And it's doable. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, it's really doable. All it needs is a little more support and participation. After all, tali to do hat se hi bachti hai na. Koi dega tabhi koi rishwat le pahe. If you decide you're not going to give, I promise you they can't get it. And thoda baut kabhi pain bhi bear karna pade. It may be worth its while, but we can make a difference if we all get together in this. But if you do write in to us, I can surely check which are these companies, what are, what are the constraints? Is it technical specifications which exclude certain set of suppliers? Is it the financial requirements? I don't know what the particular inhibiting factor is, but if you do write in to us, we can investigate it and try and resolve it. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Manal. I'm a third year BMS student. Um, firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on the 1.67 lakh crores you've raised for the Uday scheme. It's truly one of the most innovative schemes I've seen in recent times. My question is, as a power minister, what challenges do you face at a state level in implementing this, this scheme in separate states? Because they have their own, uh, you know, uh, laws to follow as, as, at a state level. Well, very clearly, it is a federal structure we are working in. And we have to work with the states, take them on board and work in partnership. And very often you may not get 100% concurrence with all the states. Uday, by the way, is a voluntary scheme. I have not made it compulsory for the states. I wanted it to be something that the states join voluntary out of their own volition and be happy about joining it. And you'll be delighted to know that almost the entire country has joined Uday. Two or three states are left. Uh, all of them are also at an advanced stage, and I think very shortly they will also be sending in their in-principle concurrence. Some agreements are being drawn up with four or five states which are in work in process, including Maharashtra. But by and large, the entire country has agreed to very strict monitoring parameters, and, and I've not given a single rupee in Ode to bail out any DISCOM. It's a self-restraint uh, that the states are accepting on themselves. They are accepting very challenging targets going forward. So I, I don't think I found any challenge in implementing Uday, or for that matter in any scheme. What may have happened is some state takes a little longer to understand, some does it faster. So when I introduced Uday, you'll be surprised to know one of the first states which said they want to sign up was Bihar, where I just lost an election 15 days before the introduction of Uday. I introduced Uday. And Bihar was one of the first states wanting to join. And BJP had just lost, lost the election 15 days before that. Uttar Pradesh, we fight, you know, every day, day in and day out on a political level. But when it comes to good governance and good economics, Uttar Pradesh was amongst the first five states to join Uday. So we've tried to bring in policies which are for national good. And I had the confidence that what I'm doing is a win-win for everybody. So there's no need to make it compulsory and no need to go that extra mile to persuade anybody. They will see the merit in it. And I'm, I'm happy to share with you, Uday, once fully implemented nationally, will save the power sector in India 1,80,000 crores annually. 
every year 180000 crores from 2019 onwards and that process has started many states losses are coming down rajasthan which uh, vasundhara raja inherited in 2013 with an annual loss of 15000 crores will this year bring down its losses to about 5 to 6000 crores and another two years will turn into profit so all of this is doable if i look at it as a challenge i'll always be constrained in my ability to perform if i enjoy my work and look at all of these as opportunities to do some good work is fun and results are also great as they emerge so i don't think i have any problem i i was in tamil nadu there was some misunderstanding some people reported a humorous comment i had made and they thought that now Tamil Nadu will never join. So when I reached Tamil Nadu and I was going to meet the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu, the press asked me that given the backdrop of animosity or uh, the war of words you've had, what do you expect? Will uh, How will Tamil Nadu join Ode? I said, I'm an optimist. I never look back. I look at the future. And we had a lovely meeting with the Chief Minister and I have no doubt that very soon they will join up also. So I think when you are out to do good, these limitations will never come in your way. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, sir, in this uh, wonderful journey of your life, uh, can you just uh, tell us, have you come across any failures from which we can all learn something? Well, they say Abraham Lincoln failed in everything he did all his life, but won the final uh, presidential election. Every election he lost, every business he started he lost, and I can promise you I've had tremendous failures in my life, all across. I, I, I wouldn't remember much of my childhood so much, but across the board, be it in college or school, be it in uh, my business, be it in my investment banking activities and even in my work as a minister. Failure is an equally important part of our life as success is. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember campaigning in the 1984 election where the BJP was down to two seats, two Lok Sabha seats in the country. We could have chosen to sit at home and say, Kuch hope hi nahi aage. but we continued to persevere only to grow from strength to strength to get an absolute majority in 2014. In business, I've had failures. When I went out to register myself in the defense uh, department with DRDO, I used to make steel forgings. Many of you bought DRDO me jaake register karne. And I, till today, I think that factory, we've never got registration in DRDO. Abhi yaad aya inke baat sunke. But these failures are a part of life. So many things will happen where you learn from these failures, you evolve from these failures. For that matter, I never stood first in any of my examinations in my life. I could look at that as a failure. So, failing failures are not be deter. Learn from it, do better going forward, work harder, persevere. Inevitably, you will succeed. Thank you, sir. Um, Good evening, sir, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> my question is uh, not exactly related to, I'm sorry. <clears throat> even though it's not exactly related to the power and energy ministry, but I feel it's uh, more towards sustainable development in the country. Uh, sir, Monsanto has been a name that has been, uh, you know, being used in the country in the farming and agricultural sector. And uh, it's been around for over a decade now. And uh, we also know that since this past few decades, more than 25 lakh farmers have been committing suicide, especially in the state of Maharashtra. And uh, with such a record, we have another MOU being signed with Monsanto. So how exactly does signed that... For? There's another MOU that we that uh, in Maharashtra has just been signed with uh, Monsanto. So, Monsanto, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, my question is that how does this feature in uh, the government's... Uh, plan for a larger sustainable development in the country? No, lovely question, madam. And by the way, if I used examples from the power ministry or coal ministry here, it was only to demonstrate the principle that I was talking of. 
So I have not come here to try and speak about the ministry under me. I was only reflecting on those examples, and I'm happy to talk about the government as a whole. As regards this issue about, and, and please correct your figures, uh, there are no 25 lakh farmer suicides in this India. They never have been. There is a problem. There are many distressed farmers. Our heart goes out to them. We have to do something. And the Prime Minister is on record. He has announced that this nation should work together to double the income of farmers in the next seven years or six years now till by 2022. And I think we are all working towards that goal. As regards uh, Monsanto's uh, BT uh, products or the biogenetically developed products, this government has not approved anything as yet. We have not done any MOU with any company. I assure you about that. If at all, the country has to experiment. If at all, we should study what these technologies have to op offer on pilot basis or on a lab or experimental basis. I think there's no harm in that. The country should be willing to experiment with new things. There may be a certain section of society which believes it's bad, but there's an equally large section which believes it has good potential also. We don't know. We cannot be arbitrators of this story. It's for the experts to decide. And I think it's enjoined upon us as fair government practices that we should allow innovation and allow experimentation to happen and then whatever comes out of that experiment, which is for the good of India and for the good of Indian farmers will be done, I can reassure you about that. Thank you. Um, good evening, sir. Um, we all know that the coal, power, and energy industry is very empowered when it comes to taking up projects. But has it, have there been any uh, pressure groups from inside the government or maybe from the Delhi state government that you have come across and how have you tackled them? I think the biggest pressure, if at all, I have faced is the pressure of performance. The country today is a billion plus people aspiring for a better quality of life. That certainly is a pressure that weighs heavily on all of us. And we don't have the luxury of time in terms of delivery of services to the people of India. So to that extent, there is a continuous pressure to perform. In terms of pressure groups, certainly they, you will always find people approaching you for particular favors, for particular work. But fortunately, with the level of transparency that we've been able to introduce, gradually it's seeping into the system that coming to any of us is not going to give them any special favors. By and large, now people have realized that there is no special dispensation available under this government. And if you will observe, there is some degree of recognition of that, and there's some degree of criticism of the habitual freeloaders also. There is a section of society which had become too used to having freebies or a preferential treatment. We face some criticism from that section of society, but we are happy to take that criticism. We are happier to have a situation which provides equal opportunity, fair opportunity to everybody. And that's what we are trying to do. Once you've made up your mind that you're not going to favor anybody, then it becomes much easier to face any kind of pressure groups. It's, it's something which you get used to beyond a point of time. Then it doesn't bother you at all. And I would urge all of you in your lives, don't get pressured by anything but performance. A little bit of pressure on yourself for good performance is good pressure. But if you get pressured under somebody else, to do something which you don't like, believe me, it will be very harmful to your success. So that's the time you have to take a call. You have to be willing to stand up to any such pressure in whatever job or vocation or work that you're doing. And once you can withstand that pressure, work will be joyous, work will be fun. And I appeal to all of you to look at work as fun, not just as a job. Thank I you. think. Uh, Yes, the last question quickly because now he has given enough. This is. You'll answer? Okay. He's ready to answer. Sir. That's good. So I would like to congratulate you for all the achievements that you and your team has done and the government as large. But there is a question that's deep down in the youth that we have. Today you're doing all these policies for a sustainable growth. But what happens 
when the government changes. Because every time a government changes, sustainable policies do not happen, are not sustained, and it goes for a toss. That is something that hurts all of us, and we keep seeing that, and that is something Good that has to The solution is don't change the government, work so that the government stays. But apart from that, the more and more that we set in policies and procedures and transparently the world knows about it. For any future government now, for example, on coal block auctions, no government on earth can come into India and reverse the auction process. Spectrum auction. Equal opportunity for people to participate in government tenders. These are things as they get ingrained in the system. I'm very confident that no future political leader or government, irrespective of which party or political formulation they belong to, will be able to change, which is why I gave the example of creating a solid foundation which lasts for several years and years and years of prosperity for the country. I'm very confident the country has a very bright future. Participate in this bright future. Hello, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dev. I am from SYJC. So my question to you is, the scheme that you have come up with, the Ujwal uh, Assurance Discom Yojana scheme, so I would like to know what are the advantages and how is it going to be beneficial for us? Well, then I'll have to come back to Jayan again. Uh, I'll, I, I can give a lot of uh, benefits, but I'll, what I'll do is just Google Uday presentation. UDAY, Ujwal Discom Assurance Yodna, Uday presentation. Google it right now. You'll get a 72 slide deck in which I fleshed out in great detail and put it up for public consumption. Exactly what, what we are going to do in different aspects of the power value chain. And I think it will be quite educative. Otherwise, if you still have queries, mail it to me. But the bottom line of all of that is we've addressed the problem that I inherited, the past losses through financial re-engineering. We have created a roadmap of the next three or four years, how we'll improve the operational efficiency of all these discounts. And we put a hard budget constraint post 2019 so that these discounts can never once again get down to making losses. State governments have been made responsible for these losses post 2019. So it's a more, more holistic solution, addresses the past, lays a roadmap for the present and has a constraint for misdemeanor or, uh, uh, or bad policy in the future, as the gentleman earlier said also. That's the beauty of Uday. And as I said, if it saves 1,80,000 crores annually for the people of India through the savings of the discoms, I don't think I could ask for anything better. Thank, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, one question, one suggestion. Sir, the principle of good governance is rational, rationalization in taxation. Sir, now, whatever you are making good efforts, the country is reaping good benefits of it, but all the local self-government and all the state government, means they are recklessly uh, increasing their revenue by uh, very irrational methods and without accountability to the taxpayer. Sir, can anything be done about that? Yes, that's what GST is all about. Ultimately, we brought political consensus across the aisle. All parties supported GST. And the purpose of GST is to stop this kind of irrational taxation structure at different ends. In fact, that's another thing that I would like to, in conclusion, appeal to all of you about taxation. If we all pay our taxes honestly, the country can live with lower tax rates. If people are encouraged or allowed to be dishonest, then the honest taxpayer has to pay higher taxes. It's like power theft. If you allow power theft, the rates of power will go up. If everybody pays their bills honestly, we can bring down the rate for everybody. So I would urge each one of you to become ambassadors for encouraging people to pay their taxes honestly. Because if everybody pays their taxes honestly, that's when we can really bring down tax rates in the system as a whole. And that will be the true equal opportunity to everybody. And the gentleman won't have to be stressed about irrational behavior of one section or the other. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, we have to thank uh, Honorable Minister for coming here.
because even the giving thank vote of thanks also will not be uh, really possible because but our vote and our thanks are with you sir okay but uh, what is more important is that he has to catch flight and it is not possible and jain doesn't have a hawk craft to or something like that to take him to over there so we have to excuse him and he has to reach there to catch his flight so thank you very much sir please give us standing ovation he especially come from delhi for this please give us standing thank you